Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Developing a Sustainable Finance Roadmap, a Strategic Approach. My name is John Mon. I'm the coordinator of the Secretariat of the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership. The GGKP is a global partnership of over 90 organizations dedicated to green growth across the policy industry and finance communities. The Green Finance Platform brings together GGKP knowledge partners, experts, and practitioners to build a more sustainable financial system. It's a clearinghouse of market policy and regulatory innovations that support the transition towards a low carbon, resilient, and inclusive economy. We're here today because we know that climate finance is high on the international agenda. We need a breakthrough, a new roadmap on climate finance that will mobilize $1 trillion in external finance, which is needed by 2030 for emerging markets in developing countries other than China. This is from a report of the independent high level expert group on climate finance uh, from this year. In 2020, around 83 billion in climate finance was provided by developed countries to developing countries. That fell about 17 billion short of the 100 billion that had been pledged as the 2020 goal. So no, more needs to be done. The green finance platform is doing its part to work towards building a sustainable financial architecture. The green finance measures database, uh, you should have a link there in the chat, um, which we'll be launching this Friday and tomorrow, is a global compendium of sustainable finance policies and regulations across more than 100 developed and developing countries. This year, we added 100 new sustainable policy and regulatory uh, financial measures um, to the database, which uh, has brought us up to nearly 800 uh, national and subnational measures. Uh, that's a growth of over 300% since two, uh, 2015 overall. The database received funding from the Global Environment Facility as part of the Aligning Finance uh, Policies Project. As has another uh, tool uh, that we will be presenting and hearing more about shortly. Um, in September, the Green Finance Platform launched the Sustainable Finance Diagnostic Toolkit. Today is an occasion to present the Diagnostic Toolkit and deep dive into the development and implementation of sustainable finance roadmaps at the country level, and also today to learn from different countries' experiences. One of our pan panelists, unfortunately, from China has fallen ill and won't be able to join us today, but we are pleased to have speakers from both Mongolia and Nigeria joining us today for the discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a quick moment of your time to draw your attention to some of the ways in which you can participate in the audience today. In particular, I'd like to draw your attention to the Green Forum. That's an online community space for sharing and discussing insights on a range of themes and issues across the green growth space. Uh, there's a discussion there on sustainable finance that will certainly be of interest to you all with nearly a thousand members contributing. You can find that group at the greenforum.org. Also throughout the discussion today, we welcome your comments or your introductions in the chat box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. And if you'd like to pose any questions to our panelists, do make use of the Q&A box. That's a great way for you to engage directly with the panelists. Also note that we are recording this webinar and we will make that recording available within 24 hours on our website after the meeting. Uh, you'll be able to find it at today's event page on the greenfinanceplatform.org website. You should be getting a link to that also in the chat. Also, if you'd like to stay in the loop on future Green Finance Platform or GGKP webinars in other areas, uh, then do consider signing up for our newsletter at ggkp.org forward slash subscribe. All right, so without further ado, it's uh, now my honor to present today's moderator for the webinar, Florencia Baldi. 
who leads the UN convened Financial Centers for Sustainability, or FC4S, Knowledge Hub. That's a research team providing insights to financial centers. She has led on FC4S research collaborations, represented the network at the FC4S network, that is, at the G20 and other international fora for the last two years, and designed and developed a series of knowledge sharing activities, including on science-based climate tools for financial institutions. With her background in econometrics, Florencia has undertaken research on commodity prices uh, with projections at the Universidad Turquado di Tela in Argentina. An ex-sustainable finance analyst at the Argentine Ministry of the Treasury during the Argentine G20 presidency. I really can't think of anyone better suited to lead today's discussion. And, uh, and we look forward to your perspectives. Thank you so much, Florencia, I turn it over to you. Thanks Emilian, John, uh, for your detailed introduction and good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you very much. Um, to give some background about uh, fc 4 I'm here on behalf of the Financial Centers for Sustainability Network, which is a UNDP Sustainable Finance Hub Network of 39 financial centers representing $82 trillion equity market cap and managing around 82% of the global equity market. The objective of the FC4S network is to accelerate the expansion of sustainable finance by enabling financial centers to evaluate and benchmark themselves, as well as to provide tools and insights for them to engage local institutions and policymakers, and ultimately as a help accelerate market transformation. Financial centers coordination power is critical because they have an, uh, a broad multi-stakeholder approach uh, involving policymakers, technical experts, and financial market participants. And this can enable co coordination and thus build consistent approaches towards sustainability, minimizing the risk of SDG and greenwashing. At FT4S, we believe it is essential to promote spaces like this where the significance of accomplishing the Paris Agreement goal and the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, more broadly is the focus and where we can support collective action um, to build equality throughout the planet. Um, the recent takeaways from COP27 have been striking. Uh, we have learned that current policies by national governments would put uh, are on track on putting the world uh, on a much hotter 2.1 to 2.9 degrees Celsius of warming this century compared with pre-industrial level. Thus, experts agree it is crucial that all nations slash their emissions much more rapidly in order to keep global warming at a relatively safe level. Moreover, um, the gap to finance the SDGs before 2030 uh, has been estimated at um, around $5 trillion annually. So um, while this uh, has a focus that is predominantly on private financial flows, the importance of both international and domestic public flows is fully recognized, especially for many developing countries, and the role of the private sector cannot be uh, ignored. Both government actions and groundbreaking innovations are necessary to fund the net zero transition. So uh, having, um, having long viewed their institutional objectives as ancillary or irrelevant to climate policies, finance ministers have now increasingly recognized that the financial system's um, cross-cutting role in promoting sustainable development. Thus, despite the progress made, the lack of common goals and guidance risks leaping backwards in if financing for sustainable development remains inadequate. So what we're here today to talk about is the fact that lately governments and organizations have been developing sustainable finance roadmap, either to prioritize actions and activities or to bring policy cohesiveness, as well as anchor sustainable finance to, broader, to their broader policy objectives. 
uh, like mainstreaming sustainable finance within their ecosystem. Um, or another way to, to put it another way to tailor their government actions to suit individual financial systems. But why do countries need sustainable finance roadmap? This uh, guy, sorry, sustainable finance roadmap constitute a practical tool to set priorities and coordinate activities among stakeholders to accelerate the expansion of sustainable finance. They work as an agenda and form consensus on key measures and actions to be taken to advance sustainable finance in a country. In this way, they can help countries develop a clear picture of their financing needs to address sustainable development and the financial system reforms that are required to meet those needs. These documents can provide um, or have been providing, for example, recommendations and help to organize the different range of actors involved in the um, around the common conception of the roles and responsibilities. So, um, in particular, leveraging its yeah broad global network, the FCFRS network has contributed to the development of some roadmaps, collaborating with uh, its members in a bilateral basis. For instance, members such as Ireland, uh, Rwanda, and Montreal have leveraged or are in the process of leveraging to a different stage FCFRS products, in particular their its assessment program, among others, to develop their uh, individual national sustainable finance program. FCFRS has also contributed to a more specific supervisory document um, and guidance, uh, such as the ESG and sustainability reporting guidance for Mongolian companies, which was launched in April 2022, and the Nigeria Green Tagging Banking Review, launched in February this year, uh, which develops a robust reporting framework for financial institutions to report on green financing. We will hear about that um, much more from our panelists today. So, um, as John has just mentioned, given the importance of sustainable finance uh, roadmaps, the UNEP inquiry and FCFRS collaborated since 2019 to develop the Diagnostic Toolkit, which was developed and distributed online as part of the Global Environmental Facility Funded Aligning Finance Policies Project, under which the Green Finance Platform is working. So the sustainable a finance diagnostic toolkit is a 10-step questionnaire that helps facilitate the development of a national sustainable finance status report and provides inputs in developing a sustainable finance roadmap. It includes the questions, detailed examples, um, as well as the objective and rationale of each of the 10 steps um, to address directly policymakers. Um, at the end, uh, sorry, yeah, at the end of the questionnaire, you can export and download your country's sustainable finance status report in a PDF format. So after developing this specific um, collaboration and project, in 2021, FC4S um, undertook a collaboration with the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action and designed and drafted the document input to national approaches and analysis of a sample of sustainable finance roadmaps. This research piece maps 41 sustainable finance roadmaps globally from over 30 different countries, and it develops a comparison and a descriptive analysis. It also includes seven case studies and presents a natural language processing analysis, which is an artificial intelligence uh, application to identify recurring teams in the in those documents. The analysis concludes in 13 key criteria for effective sustainable finance roadmap, which can be matched with the 10 steps from the diagnostic toolkit. This document also provides useful insights on motivation, features, and usefulness of the roadmaps as part of a broader sustainability strategy. So um, to sum up, national roadmaps differ markedly in terms of their scope and content, with each one of them reflecting the specific needs of the different countries, the institution that required the development of the roadmap, and the range of factors involved in its development. 
In some cases, these uh, general recommendations from the sample of roadmaps that FCFRS and the Coalition of Finance Ministers analyzed uh, establish the basis for more specific actionable measures presented in a consequent uh, sustainable finance strategy. Um, to highlight some key conclusions which will inform further this panel, I would like to highlight uh, first a broad based participatory drafting process involving all the institutions that will ultimately implement the recommendation was identified as crucial to set realistic goals and obtain buy-in from key stakeholders. Second, um, effectively identifying market failures and designing viable policy and fiscal interventions to support the development of sustainable finance. Markets requires a coherent systematic approach by, backed by clear defined institutional responsibilities. Roadmaps should define the actors responsible for implementing each one of the recommendations. They should establish appropriate monitoring and oversight arrangements and include performance indicators whenever possible. Even when the roadmap is merely designed to establish a strategic framework, it should define a concrete set of clear and feasible pathways to advance the transition uh, of sustainable finance and avoid vague language or impractical objectives. They should consider addressing data gaps while leveraging digital available digital solutions, as well as consider actions towards building capacity and raising awareness about sustainable finance within the financial system. And lastly, but not least, uh, periodically assessing and publicly reporting the state of sustainable finance and the changes underway help sustain progress and prevent backsliding because transparency incentivizes actors to comply with their obligations and commitments. So our discussion today will come with experts in the matter who have both collaborated with governments to deliver um, sustainable finance roadmaps in different regions. But um, before introducing them, um, I'd like to give the yeah uh, give the floor to the um, um, organizers for them to share a short video on the diagnostic toolkit. Welcome to the Sustainable Finance Diagnostic Toolkit. The Sustainable Finance Diagnostic Toolkit is a 10-step questionnaire that provides practical guidance to policymakers to improve their understanding of actions to enhance sustainable finance mobilization. Each step of the toolkit represents the core components to examine the sustainable finance status of a country. Step 1. Building the narrative. Step 2. Defining sustainable finance. Step 3. Sustainable finance needs. Step 4. Sustainable finance stocks, flows and future investment gap. Step 5. Barriers to sustainable finance. Step 6. Aligning with international experience. Step 7. Mapping the national financial system. Step 8. Drivers of sustainable finance. Step 9. Stock taking, progress to date. Step 10. Potential innovations, interventions. The report tailored to your country will feed into the development of the Sustainable Finance Roadmap. To have a deeper view of other jurisdictions' green finance regulatory journey, browse the Green Finance Measures database. Build your own narrative to develop a national sustainable finance roadmap. Yes, yeah, for today's discussion, um, we have Olumi de Lala, who is a co-founder and director of Climate Transition Limited. He has provided advisory services to financial institutions and government in different countries across Africa. His areas of focus include sustainable development in emerging economies, climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies, and climate finance. Olumide has over 20 years capital market experience delivering technology and enabled strategic solutions and sustainable finance and market infrastructure products that have created value and wealth to clients. We also have 
uh, the, the honor to be joined by Nandia Enkubsin, who works at the Mongolian Sustainable Finance Association as a senior policy and partnership manager and project coordinator at Mongolia Green Finance Corporation. Her main fields of work and expertise are sustainability taxonomies, green and gender inclusive financial products and pipeline development, m and &E, uh, on sustainable finance implementation and designing the sustainable financing schemes and specific tools for different fields. She also contributed to developing the national roadmap for sustainable financing in Mongolia and establishing the Mongolia Green Finance Corporation, a unique public-private partnership institution with a special mandate to promote green finance in the country. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Olumide the first question. Uh, Olumide, what are the policy and regulatory interventions that your country has made or, or um, to close the sustainable investment gap, please? Good morning all, and thank you for having me this morning. Um, that's a very good question. And I think in terms of answering that question, we'll probably have to go way back uh, some 10 years when the uh, Nigerian Sustainable Banking Principles was actually uh, developed and released, which more or less we focused um, the banking sectors uh, onto trying to ensure that funding goes towards um, what we will call uh, the, the sustainable type projects. Since then, we've had a number of um, directives, if you will, that has transcribed through the system, ranging from the national climate change policy uh, issued around the same time, straight through, even through to um, uh, more recently, where we've had in the last three years, um, which is more or less transited itself into the, the Green Bonds program, which uh, was also sponsored um and uh, adopted by the government but in terms of policies themselves we've had the uh national action plan on gender and climate change we've had a national economic sustainable plan which was all released in 2020 we've had a, an updated ndc um for climate change laws as well recently and in november last year we had a we had a, a new climate change law enacted by the government um, which more or less transits itself into a national adaptation communication uh, plan. Um, in the last couple of uh, uh, years, uh, sorry, in the last couple of months, uh, we've also had an energy transition plan announced, uh, which will cost something um, around four, $410 billion uh, between now and 2060. And also, we've also had a first carbon budget submitted for approval by uh, the parliament. So there's a lot going on in the system. Um, the central bank, for instance, off the back of the the uh, reports that you, the study that we did, uh, the green bond study, the green tagging study that we did with the with the pilot of the banks, uh, are now working on a, a climate uh, related, some a climate uh, related risk uh, financial frameworks for the banking sector. So a lot of stuff is going on in the system itself. And all purpose of it is obviously to galvanize uh, action towards driving um, funding, as it were, and climate finance from the private sector, especially, towards the right projects. Thank you. That, that was really a lot of um, very informative. Um, shifting, now turning to Nandia. Uh, what were the latest policy and regulatory interventions in Mongolia to close the sustainable investment gap? Um, thank you, Florencia, for the question. So actually, uh, the sustainable finance journey in Mongolia started back in 2013. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, we are the member serving NGO called Mongolian Sustainable Finance Association. But uh, really, the Mongolian Sustainable Finance Initiative has been started in 2013. But uh, the most important thing is that it is initiated not by the government, but uh, the commercial banks or the private institutions in Mongolia. So uh, all commercial banks in Mongolia joined uh, to implement um, the sustainable finance 
frameworks in their uh, financing practices and operations. And um, the guiding frameworks includes that uh, in the first place, we have uh, introduced Mongolian sustainable finance principles. We have eight principles. And um, following that uh, sustainable finance principles, we also have this ESMS framework or environmental, social and management system framework, uh, which includes uh, five sector guidelines and ESG risk assessment tool. So after uh, uh, introducing such frameworks and tools to uh, all commercial banks, uh, starting from 2020, uh, non-bank uh, financial institutions are also joining our association as our principal and supporting members. So basically, uh, Mongolian um, financial uh, system is uh, mostly um, consists of the commercial banks and um, other uh, financial institutions other than the public budgetary so uh, I, I would um, confidently say that uh, most of the financial market is covered by this Mongolian sustainable finance principles and for the question uh, uh, about recent um, fiscal policies uh, on the green and sustainable finance um, in the in last March, uh, initiated by the president of Mongolia, we have organized this uh, regional forum on green economy. And during this uh, forum, uh, we have um, we have got approved the national roadmap for sustainable financing by the Financial Stability Council of Mongolia. So Financial uh, Stability Council of Mongolia consists of four main financial regulators, which is Ministry of Finance, Central Bank of Mongolia, Financial Regulatory Commission, and the Deposit Insurance Corporation. So it means that uh, all important uh, financial regulators approved our uh, roadmap, and uh, if 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 the audience is wondering what is roadmap, uh, it is basically a financial sector action plan to implement uh, sustainable finance until 2030. So uh, within this uh, sustainable finance roadmap, we have two uh, quantitative, uh, oh, sorry, qualitative um, uh, targets which is uh, by the 2030, we have to increase uh, the green loan portfolio up to 10% um, of the total banking sector portfolio. And for the non-bank financial sector, this amount is at least 5%. So uh, if we can reach this 10% and 5% goals uh, by the 2030, it means that only by the uh, banks and NBFIs can finance our NDCs. Uh, and 15% uh, uh, of the NDC alone. So uh, it's a really huge milestone for the Mongolian sustainable finance development, I would say. And um, I'm sorry time is ticking, but I'd like to add uh, two more uh, important documents. Uh, one is that, um, as I said before, uh, within past two years, a lot was going on uh, in the Mongolian financial sector. Uh, sustainable finance was heavily focused on only commercial banks in the past like five, eight years. But uh, in the past two years, we really expanded into non-bank financial sector. I mean, uh, for the non-bank financial institutions, insurance market, capital market, and uh, we also introduced sustainable stock exchange initiative in Mongolia. So within all this initiative, uh, two important documents also published. Uh, one is uh, we have developed our green bond regulation. Uh, it is initiated by the IFC and MSFA, our organization, and endorsed by the Financial Regulatory Commission. And uh, the second important document is um, we have developed uh, with the help of UNDP and um, UNEPFI, we have developed this uh, ESG and sustainability reporting guideline for Mongolian listed companies. Um, so, uh, which also was a huge milestone for Mongolian stock exchange, especially for the green capital market development. And um, I'll stop there. And um, if there were any questions regarding this, I would happy to address later. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nadine. That was a really exhaustive description of the latest policy updates in Mongolia. Um, and let me tell you that both uh, Nigeria and Mongolia as part of FC4S have been, uh, let's say, actively participating within the network, specifically um, we've been supporting the ESG, the, the ESG guidelines in Mongolia, as well as the green tagging banking review in Nigeria. 
Um, so leveraging, I, I would like to highlight the bottom-up approach that both of those documents have, like pilots and studies at the financial firm level and analysis were made. And from there, the regulation has been developed. Uh, moving on to more specific um, challenges. I would like to know, um, um, what are the persistent barriers in transforming the financial system to be aligned with sustainability goals? And in particular, what can you tell us about sustainable capital markets infrastructure gaps across Africa? So that's an interesting question. Um, I think the, the, the first thing to point out is that there's a danger of looking at Africa as one country. Um, each each region and each country basically is as developed at a different level um, and, as, uh, and as such have different challenges. But rather than looking at them from challenges, perhaps you look at it from the opportunity that that presents. So, you know, we're making reference to Nigeria earlier on, for instance, and we're talking about some of the things that we've done since 2012 in the sustainable space. You've just stated that Lagos obviously is part of the F FC for s network. We've also got a program uh, to develop the uh, um, the uh, SME side of the economy you, uh, through the uh, Climate Finance Accelerator Program, which is being organized uh, and uh, sponsored by BASE, uh, the, by the US, uh, the UK government. Um, in that also we've, we've um, We've worked with the SEC to have listings and issuance rules for green bonds. That has obviously created itself into the first uh, sovereign. We've had two sovereign issuance of green bonds in Nigeria, as well as as well as uh, a first uh, financial institu financial uh, institution that issued a certified green bond uh, access bank. And we've had other uh, issuance as well. But you know, in terms of some of the some of the the, the challenge that we're having in accelerating this process beyond that are uh, uh, what you might call market structure related problems in terms of, yes, it's a deep enough market, but at the same time, you've got situations whereby you've got government lending, crowding out private sector borrowings. You've got situations whereby obviously uh, due to, to currency issues, um, a lot of investors are looking for opportunities in hard currency where obviously the local issues are looking to issue in um, local currency instead. And so that, that's, there's a bit of a mismatch in terms of where the fund is coming from. But more importantly, data availability and quality is also an issue in itself in trying to uh, get demonstrable as well as defendable information uh, for reporting against uh, assets. Identification of these assets is another thing that we've been working on. You know, setting the right criteria and actually applying global taxonomies, which you know lends itself to the fact that in the same way that you've had in South Africa, where they've just recently developed a local taxonomy of their own, which is more or less leans towards some of the issues um, that are specific to South Africa, will that uh, enable the catalyzation of that market? Is another opportunity that we're looking at. Rwanda, if you move further up to the east, I've just issued the IREMA Invest um, to catalyze uh, project preparation, as well as private sector into funding SMEs uh, through, through a collaboration between the Green Finance, the uh, Green Fund, FONEWA and, and BRD. Um, and, and that's another, another uh, uh, opportunity that uh, is being developed in that area. If you come further, further west as well, uh, the Francophone region, for instance, which is the WAMU region, is a bit more challenged in that it's slightly behind the curve when it comes to some of the work that has been done. They've just had a private placement there, um, uh, uh, Emerging Plaza um, in the WAMU region. But you know, if you speak to why that was the case, um, the issue is that, look, they weren't too sure if they listed on the market, if, for instance, there would be an uptake on that. Uh, even though there was a, a bit of a greenium on that transaction. So if you look at the entire scope, East Africa, for instance, if you look at Kenya, there's a lot going on in there. Uh, we've been wanting, uh, we've been working with the governments to issue a green bond there for some time, a sovereign green bond, but we've obviously succeeded, succeeded with the issuance of the ACON uh, real estate. I think the issue with Africa uh, generally 
if you look at it as one entity, is that we have a lot of adaptation and resilience type projects that we would like to focus on, the natural capital, biodiversity. But unfortunately, the current taxonomy as it sits are quite mitigating focus, uh, looking to energy, um, energy uh, transition. But, you know, some of the issues, if you look at South Africa in terms of energy transition, for instance, where there's coal and there's a possibility of applying gas. If you move to the West, Nigeria, where there's energy swap from the diesel potentially to gas, there isn't enough support in the current taxonomy to apply uh, funding to that. So there's a need to look at every country individually, uh, potentially look at regions to see if there's a possibility of developing taxonomies that are aligned to, or, or should I say acceptable to foreign investors, but obviously are more appropriate to uh, the, the local, uh, local development sustainability economy requirements. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, thank you very much, Lumire. It, it makes perfect sense and it's really, um, let's say, why um, what you have just said of considering both regional and like sub -re yeah, regional and national uh, specificities. In that sense, uh, this type of uh, supervisory guidance documents and sustainable finance roadmap are really helpful to identify the different status where uh, countries are taking, um, let's say from, from which countries are, are starting or their, yeah, their starting point. So moving to Nandia. I would like to ask uh, which are the, the persistent barriers in transforming the financial system to be aligned with sustainability goals? I'd like to, let's say, tailor that question a, a bit more for Mongolia, just because we know that data availability and capacity and yeah, finance professionals capacity are pressing issues globally, as well as disclosure requirements and let's say standardization. But specifically in Mongolia, uh, where you have mentioned that the banking sector is so important, which are the, the barriers, uh, let's say, the, the banks face in a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, it's also a great question, but uh, touching upon what Olimide says, taxonomy is very important and it should be very, very tailored. Uh, for each country individually and um, uh, for Mongolia uh, what are the lessons we learned is that uh, as um, as some of you know that we we become the second country to develop a uh, green economy in the country uh, after China and before you but um, looking at this now uh, as um, if you can just uh, look at the green economy we basically just uh, provide list of uh, activities which contribute to the green eco economy without uh, proper properly addressing what are the impacts and uh, what can we measure monitor and report such impacts uh, respective to each um, activity listed in the green economy but uh, regarding that, uh, banks were issuing uh, many uh, green uh, loan products and green loan, green uh, any type of green loans, and uh, we also, uh, as I said before, uh, developed such a uh, green bond regulation, right? But um, without proper uh, citation of this uh, MRV framework, we cannot uh, telling or pushing uh, the financial institutions to implement such green economy or SDG finance economy, and. Um, Based on these uh, lessons, uh, we're also expanding this national green taxonomy into SDG finance taxonomy. Uh, the, the work is actually going uh, on right now. So uh, for the newly developed uh, SDG finance taxonomy, we also um, adding the social sectors because globally climate uh, adaptation activities are lacking more uh, investments uh, rather than the uh, climate mitigation activities. So we're also introducing uh, education and health and ICT sectors uh, included in the SDG finance taxonomy. And uh, one of the important um, uh, milestone is that we also addressed uh, impact indicators for each sectors included in the SDG finance taxonomy, which is uh, almost 
Over 240 activities are included in SDG Finance Taxonomy, so this is a huge work, and uh, we're, we're, we're looking uh, very uh, looking forward to uh, got approved this by the Financial Stability Council earlier ne uh, next year. And um, speaking of the barriers, uh, aside from the MRV framework, uh, one, one or two uh, barriers is that capacity building, uh, local capacity building especially, and uh, the second one is market demand or i would say market preparedness because you know um after upon the uh, approval of uh, national green taxonomy many financial institutions uh, have been uh, developing such green financial products but uh, when the time comes to really selling these uh, green financial products to the market there were no huge demand from the market so um, I'm saying that uh, uh, from the uh, financial institution side, there were more of a supply, but uh, from the market, there were a uh, very low demand. So um, in terms of uh, market preparedness, I would say market is not that ready for this uh, near zero or green transition in a such um, short time period. So uh, for, for the developing countries like Mongolia, these transition risks and transition transition strategy is um, one of the most um, challenging uh, barriers uh, that we face, I would say. And um, for, for the capacity building, um, it, it looks like uh, MSFA and our members are doing um, doing a lot and making progress in the market but at the same time it's just one sector right it's just one financial sector but to really push the sustainability agenda all of the sectors should um, also build uh, some more capacity in the sustainable development or any such um, skills such as uh, tracking the GHGs or I don't know uh, anything related to MRV impact GHG and uh, carbon emissions so I would say these are the uh, three barriers out of many thank you that was really clear and straightforward and yeah and in that sense I'd like to um, let's say yeah direct another brief question to you how do you see that tools like the Diagnostic Toolkit or building a sustainable finance roadmap or a more encompassing approach, let's say, by uh, diverse financial stakeholders or complete financial centers could help, um, let's say, build that uh, demand for, for sustainable finance products in the market? Do you think that these documents kind of help raise awareness or do you think it's it's more related to capacity building from finance professionals. Is that question in to learning, me? like, sorry, in learning, like, to identify the the finance, the sustainable financial products. Uh, that was initially for Nandia. Sorry, okay. but maybe you can jump in later. No um. So the question was for me <laughs> yeah i can i can rephrase it uh do you think that sustainable finance roadmaps or yeah or the type of policy documents that the diagnostic toolkit deliver uh do you think that they help raise market awareness and bring cohesiveness or do you think that like the is a, is a problem more market awareness or is it more capacity building let's say lack of capacity or knowledge from mm -hmm. finance uh, professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I would say uh, upon this um, newly uh, approved document called National Roadmap for Sustainable Finance is really uh, uh, a highlight of this year uh, for the sustainable finance development journey in Mongolia. So, um, you know, as I mentioned before, this roadmap has to um, um, quantitative targets and these quantitative targets really uh, signal to the market uh, especially for commercial banks and the non-bank financial institutions because it is mandatory uh, for the banks to reach their green loan portfolio at least 10 percent by the 2030 right so uh, banks are really um, working on uh, how how can we increase the uh, current green portfolio and uh, how can we like um 
get another source of funding from international markets or they're also exploring some more opportunities like um, developing green bonds, SDG linked bonds and uh, also uh, we have also uh, receiving many um, Requests, requests on, on capacity building for for the internal um, for their internal capacity building, such as uh, providing some trainings uh, or like um, uh, uh, providing study tours to other countries. And uh, for the NBFIs, uh, it's uh, quite new for for the non bank financial sector, so uh, they are really um, facing this uh, huge demand uh, from the clients and uh, mm -hmm. from their international partners. So uh, rather than um, the roadmaps are creating burden, it really pushes the market to take action. So yeah, I would say that. Thank you, thank you. And Olumide, um, if I can turn quickly to you, what would be like the, yeah, the most, um, like what, what do you see the value add from this kind of policy documents, like the diagnostic toolkit, outcome and the sustainable finance roadmap? I, I think what, what, is, what is clear is that um, a, a lot of policy work has been done. Uh, on the policy side. So there a lot of work has been done there and we've, we've tried to create regulations, but I haven't said that you could argue that there's more work that needs also needs to be done in, in terms of clarification of how these um, uh, policies apply. Uh, capacity building is essential. I mean, if you look on the investment side, um, the, on the demand side, the reason why demand is low is probably because there's still a focus on, on returns. You know, investors focus is mainly on returns, uh, and then of course on risk, risk of the, the risk profile of the um, of the issuer or the the or, or, or the proponent of the project, and more importantly, uh, the project itself. And then we begin to look at uh, um, the green side of it. Having said that, um, there's a level of education that needs to go into the system so that investors begin to understand that there is actually a long-term benefit to shifting from uh, what we call brown assets into green assets, uh, either from uh, the, the risk of stranded assets uh, in the future, the cost of refinancing those positions. And basically, generally, it's not just on the impact itself that you know, investing in green, it has a higher return in the long term. We begin to see some areas where we're having greeniums. As I said, I mentioned the, 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 the opportunity out in, uh, in uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, there was a greenium there. There was an, uh, an FI in, in Namibia where there was a greenium. Obviously, we didn't we didn't see that in Nigeria. We didn't see that in in uh, in Kenya. But what we've realized is that even though the initial um, issuance had some sort of a, a, a guarantee support, when they've now come back to the market for subsequent issuance. Uh, they didn't need the guarantees. So obviously that that is resonating with the investor side. Now, on the supply side, there just isn't enough. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, project preparation is very important. So a lot of the work that needs to be going into this space right now is obviously capacity building, capacity building, capacity building. Can't stress that enough. But a lot of more money needs to go into TA to support the project preparation side of things, You know, helping people understand how to identify green assets, but more importantly as well, you don't want to overburden uh, smaller companies with reporting requirements. You know, if we can basically build a, a, a framework that allows for the, 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 at least the minimum data required to be captured, and then we can then build on that as we gain more knowledge. So a lot of the work, as I said, the effort should be going more into education capacity. And of course, another thing is the availability of resources in local terms. So verifiers right now I tend to be more foreign companies. There's a lot of, it's costing a lot. We need to do more to uh, have more local verifiers um, to assist within the system, sustainability, and, and especially, especially people who understand the effects of climate risk. So, you know, where initially we we're all talking about use of proceeds, now we're talking about impact, and it's beginning to become more mandatory for reporting purposes. And of course, there's a lot more work that needs to be done with regards to um, uh, carbon emissions, actually understanding the implications of that on your reporting. What we want to do is avoid the risk of greenwashing. So the only way you can get to that 
yes, we're working on the policy side, which is on the regulatory side, and we'll create a safe environment. There's market depth that needs to be looked at, market structure, but also on the project side, preparation, preparation, preparation. Obviously, there's a lot of tea that needs to go into that. And a lot of work is being done, but just not, not enough at the moment. Thank you very much, Lumine. There's a comment in the chat box uh, from Miss uh, from Ahmed Belal uh, that reads, I totally agree with Mr. Lala regarding embedding the national context into the global roadmap and based on what has been discussed during COP, I believe that sustainable finance can be used as a very effective tool for debt swap in developing countries, especially in Africa. I believe it is time to take the right actions to achieve the desired goals and not only talk and burden developing countries with more debt. If, so, I, can just, if I can just drop add to that, uh, there are yeah. tools, by the way, financial tools that we begin to look at. The innovative financial tools that we never had before that we have today, but they're even new ones. So just as a very quick one, today we talk about carbon credit markets, right? In my own opinion, the way the carbon credit market is functioning is, is totally wrong. It doesn't work in favor of the developing emerging markets. And I think we need to re, we need to look at that rather than talk about how you sell carbon credits and uh, you know to the developed market who should be reducing the emissions, by the way, because I think it's a bit of a farce, uh, if I have to be honest. We can actually use carbon credits to leverage new finance into the developed world. So Africa has a lot of carbon credit opportunities, but my view is we don't sell it. We use it to leverage more capital, to private capital, more tier into the system. And that's one of the ways we actually build more capital flow into Africa for projects. Great, thanks. I see there are a lot of interesting, very interesting comments in the chat box. I'll just read um, this question from Aruna Lashley Gohill, uh, which reads, are the investors in green finance anticipating transparency in the process and exchange of information on the project proposals? Uh, this uh, sustainable finance diagnostic toolkits or roadmap, is this a reason for hesitation in investing by investors? What are your thoughts on that? Can you repeat the question again, please? Can you yeah. the question? Like, are the investors in green finance anticipating transparency in the process and exchange on the, in the exchange of information on the project proposals? And is this a reason for hesitation in investing by investors? Um, transparency, let's say. Look, I, 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 think, I think we need to set the right metrics. In my own opinion, yeah. Um, investors investors need to 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 be more clear as to what they're looking for outside your normal, as I said, revenue and and um, and uh, uh, risk. Yeah. Not every investor is looking to make the the same impact. Yeah. So it's about alignment. You know, we find the right sectors for the right investor uh, interest. And, and once we're able to aggregate that, and I think to a large extent, building pipelines of projects, yeah, with as much data uh, available allows for investors to actually be a bit more selective in what they do, if you see what I mean. Uh, and and that, that potentially could, could assist. But the, there's a, the, I think the lack of, as I said earlier, the lack of data availability and clarity and quality has impacted, has solely impacted this market and uh, in terms of the drive towards, towards green. So a lot more needs to be focused in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Alumide. Um, I see you were unfortunately um, almost running out of time. I'd just like to ask Nadine whether, um, do you have a specific insight from your gender, specifically gender related focus? Uh, do you have any let's say comment for regarding how to develop specific gender related products for um, both markets and government. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so um, if, if we talk about ESG, we really um, give particular focus on the E side in the past years. And uh, starting from 2020, we're, we're collaborating with UNDP and the Asia Foundation on developing gender responsive financial practices. Because, you know, financial uh, decisions are really 
um, going to the family and they're deciding uh, what the money goes and uh, what would be the impact, right? So we really thought that uh, gender responsive financial practices is important for Mongolian markets. And also uh, there are specific reasons that, uh, for the financial institutions and uh, for the financial market in a bigger picture to take the gender into consideration because women are the untapped market because um, globally, uh, most of the women uh, have these unmet financial needs. And for the Mongolian context, um, many women has this uh, very uh, lower access than men to uh, financial assets or uh, any uh, kind of financial activities because uh, there are also some reasons one is um, I would say social norms because you know there's this uh, traditional social norms that all of the collateral or the assets should be named after the fathers brothers or some men and uh, this really creates this confusion that um, women cannot own assets Asset. And without asset, women cannot access to finance, right? So we, so we, since um, we have this member-serving NGO operating in the financial market, we can't just one day, um, and uh, we can't just change uh, all the women to um, own assets. So uh, instead of this, we're we're uh, we're. Um, promoting our members, uh, which is uh, financial institutions, uh, to develop this uh, gender responsive of our feminized, dedicated financial products for women because they are untapped market and also their financial needs are not met. And um, for uh, it also link very um, uh, attached and linked to the regulators decision or fiscal policies, you know, because uh, merely the financial institutions are following uh, fiscal orders and jurisdictions. And uh, if the uh, local fiscal policies are not that gender sensitive or gender responsive, mm -hmm. Uh, any uh, one financial institution cannot change the whole market. So uh, yeah. regarding these uh, many reasons, we have developed many um, guidelines and tools uh, for our members to better understand their um, all fiscal decisions through a gender lens. Yeah, <laughs> so I think it's it's time to stop. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Thanks for those specific and straightforward insights. I'd like to thank you really sincerely, both Olumide and Nandia, for your time and attention. Your insights were brilliant and really informative. We look forward to um, seeing you all engage in the newly launched Diagnostic Toolkit, as well as uh, with the JJKP and the AFTIFRS network. Olumide, do you have any? Yeah, I just, I, sorry, I, I just one minute. I, in addition to what uh, Nadine was saying about gender, I would actually like to make a, a, a play for the youth. Um, the average age in Africa is 19, uh, both men and women. So certainly there's a need for looking to sustainability driven job creation and projects that will bring about uh, uh, the kind of jobs that we're looking for. There needs to be, I mean, yes, when we talk about ESG, there seems to be an overemphasis on environment and and um, and uh, climate, but you know even if you were to double uh, Africa's emission tomorrow, it still wouldn't register anywhere on the rector scale. So you know the practicality for us is how do we focus on adaptation and resilience? How do we create enabling environment for manufacturing, and you know so that we can have more jobs for the youth? But also there's an emphasis on governance. Um, we talked about data availability and data quality. If we can get governance right, we'll obviously increase investor investor confidence. Um, the policies are there. We just need to make sure that we gather data. And to speak to what Nadine was saying in terms of gender, um, yes, I agree with her. You know, gender uh, the, the the women are better. It will appear better business people uh, naturally, but we don't collect enough data to support that. So there's a need to collect the data to support that. Uh, as I've always stated, you know, in God we in God we we trust. Everybody else bring data. Once you bring data, you're able to support your position and the investment to flow. So for me, it's it's more the governance as well as the social. Yes, there's an element of of uh, the environment uh, clearly, but unfortunately, the taxonomies as they sit today are more in support of emissions, and that's what drives the money. 
So we need to focus on, on, on core benefits. On that, I will rest. Thank you very much for having us. Um, Thank you. We're talk. immensely grateful for making, uh, for making this session a great success, and we look forward to further engaging with all the participants through the, the, uh, the proposed uh, channels. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you for having us. Thank you.